Workplace psychological safety is the most pressing need we have today. But do you have the tools to transform a toxic workplace into a psychologically safe one? We have a course for that. It is called From Tormentor to Mentor, Building a Psychologically Safe Workplace. With this self-study three-hour online course, you can equip yourself and your organization to understand workplace bullying and harassment. More importantly, our course shows you how to build a foundation for a safe and healthy workplace using the SWELL principle, safety, well-being, encouragement, and learning. Elimination of bullying will only work if a foundation of psychological workplace safety has been intentionally built and maintained. Go to shiftworkplace.co slash tormentor to mentor to learn more. That's shiftworkplace.co slash tormentor to mentor. Hello, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. Today, I'm very excited to present you my guest, Devin Riel, who has a really interesting business story that I know you are going to love. He's been managing the Avonlea Group of Companies for almost five years, and prior to that, he was an events manager for the Special Events Division of Avonlea, and he got his start through his mother's networking group, Business Networking International, where his mother uh, met one of the primary owners, and that person was looking for someone to help run their company's seasonal photo operations. And the photo operations took place in local shopping centers, and believe it or not, it had to do with Santa. And you think of all those Santas in the shopping malls, that takes a lot of organizing and event planning, takes good logistics, a good administrative mind, and it's something that people need to set up. And so Devin got started doing that through Santa. So when I first met him, I asked him, hey, Devin, how did you get started on your business? And he said, Santa, Santa started me out on my business. (laughs) And he was an elf, a very tall elf. And then he went from being an elf to being the organizer and general manager for the company, which has branched out and bought their biggest competitor and now also does sports photography in addition to the event photography and all of the Santa events with photography in malls, which is seasonal. And I'm sure much more, but it's a really interesting business story. So I thought we should hear from Devin and find out a little bit about him. So Devin, that was the sort of official bio, but can you maybe tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so you did a really good job of, uh, of explaining all that. You know, I'm a very technical thinker. So what I like to do is approach a task and just kind of put it out into segments. And so you're technically, you're talking about photography and setting things up in a schedule. Is that what you mean? Or when you say you're a technical uh, person, what, what are you thinking when you're saying technical? Um, more uh, technologically oriented and uh, systems focused. Mm-hmm. So I like when a process is really well defined and just make it happen and work with people, train them. It all works for me. Mm -hmm. So do you have a lot of people to train and manage in your operations? Yes. So with the seasonal business, uh, we bring on about 45 to 60 people, depending on how much we have going on that year. Um, You know, a dozen of them being Santas who are all older gentlemen with real beards and it can be a lot of fun. (laughs) You could start your pitch with saying, hey, I train Santas and elves for a living. It's so good. I mean, just, I I can't stop thinking of new ways to say this. (laughs) Yeah, the amount of a real bearded gentleman that I approach on the street and just say, hey, you look like someone I know. You know who I'm talking about? And depending on their answer, you know, I go a little further. Sometimes they just say, who are you? Get away. Or they say, yeah, I get that a lot. Ho, ho, ho. And that's when I really start getting into it. Hey, you know, would, would you be interested in potentially playing that role with us at a local shopping center? <laughs> so have you ever had a Santa that didn't work out that you thought would be good because he looked the part? Oh yeah, it's uh, our our stories are endless. You know, we try not to share them too outwardly, just because it is a relatively sensitive topic. But typically, during the interview, we notice you know they may not have a very good filter on what they say. You know, they can be smelly sometimes, which just won't work. You know, if it's you know severe halitosis, it's not something that can be addressed easily, and therefore we can't have them on the chair. Wow, you have to be really sensitive and thoughtful in the way you approach these things. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, you know, with the culture, the way it is these days, you know, it's, it's, it's a character role. It can only be filled by a certain segment of society. And it's, uh, it's interesting. Huh. So tell me, what makes a good Santa? The energy, the enthusiasm, the desire to be Santa. The best Santas are the ones who really take ownership of it. And they actually want to be Santa. They're not doing it for a job. They feel like they're the real Santa. And sometimes it's a little weird that they get so into it, but that's what makes the best Santa. Like when they almost think 
that they're the real Sam. Wow, kind of like Elvis impersonations, becoming the real Elvis. It's exactly like that. <laughs> Maybe that's your next gig, Elvis photos. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, and what makes a good elf? Customer service, really, you know, the ability to just kind of, you know, kind of like what a Starbucks employee has to deal with. You just have to keep up all the time, high energy, especially like when you're taking the photos, you really have to be on the ball and make it happen. You have to be loud and you just have to have a presence. Hmm. You know, It's great. I never really thought before I met you, I never really thought how much went into creating that Santa event at malls. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. So can you share a couple of incidents from your childhood that you think affected the person that you are today? You did maybe affected the way that you approach life or the the way that you approach the things that you have to organize for your role? Absolutely. Um, You know, my my parents separated when I was quite young. So I actually never had a lot of uh, conflict in my life. Whereas, you know, I find and when I look out in the world and I, I see a lot of conflict between couples and what their kids have to deal with and what their kids see and the way they learn to behave and perform uh, kind of centers around how their parents behave and, and perform around each other. And I just found that not having a mom and a dad who were together to be super beneficial for my temperament and the way that I behave, just minimal conflict and that kind of stuff. Now, that is something I've also never heard before. You're just one novel comment after another. So I haven't heard before that people said, I'm really glad that I grew up with my parents being separated because it's, it was really su- suitable to my temperament. So maybe explain a little bit more what you mean by that. Well, okay. So I got this insight at an early age because, you know, I did have the opportunity to have siblings that weren't blood siblings, right? I'm an only child by birth, but because of uh, my parents' separation, I got to experience kind of different uh, family cultures uh, by means of my parents connecting with other parents and developing strong relationships and really getting so involved that we were at one point living together and then eventually splitting off. So what I learned by analyzing those individuals, um, my step-siblings in part, is that the, the younger they were when their parents separated, the less they were impacted by the separation, right? Interesting. So if you're fortunate enough to have your parents split before you are capable of really, you know, complex thought or, you know, in, independence in, in any, any way, shape or form, I feel like you have a bit of an advantage as, as opposed to someone who spent the key years of their development with their parents being together and then at the you know young and ripe and very sensitive age of three, four, five, six, having their parents split and having to go through all the ramifications of that split at that key development tends to affect people differently. You know, I saw it in my older step siblings who had their parents split when they were at that sensitive age. And I just, I noticed some behavioral qualms, so to speak, uh, you know, typically more on the rebellious, uh, typically more on the anger side, and just a little harder to jive with, as opposed to the ones that were younger, like me, they're just a little bit more chill, they, they were just kind of okay with it. They this this is all they knew. It's just different. Right. So maybe some unresolved issues when you get older, because you can start to think about it more and respond emotionally in a way that you can reflect on your emotions. So it can affect you certainly a lot more as you, as you get older. Absolutely. So that's one thing, but is there something else in your childhood that you think really, it's a, maybe a story that came up that you, you think was something that really helped to build you? Um, not really a specific story, but you know, I was fortunate enough to have a computer when I was younger and my mom got into computers and she learned things about computers you know, when I was really young and she imparted them to me and I kind of attribute my technological success and the reason that I can be a successful person in today's world to that. You know, she, she learned hotkeys before hotkeys were a thing. Like I go out into the world and I interact with people and they don't know what, you know, copy paste and these hotkeys do. And I'm, it shocks me, but because I learned that at such a young age, it really gave me a, an advantage in the in the technical side of the world. And that's really where everything's going. And that's helped me a lot. It makes me think that basically, the more your parents are continuing to learn and discover and grow, the more you will. It's the same thing in a company. 
if the leadership of the company is growing and developing, that becomes the culture of the whole company. And so if they're always doing the same old, same old, and they don't learn anything new, the company stagnates in that same way. But it sounds like you had a mother who was always learning and ready to adopt new things and be a part of the technology world rather than saying that she was afraid of it. And that would have shaped you somewhat, hey? Absolutely. You, you really hit the nail on the head with that, for sure. So from the groups that you belong to, what aspects of those cultures would you say you've adopted into your leadership style? Because you're managing, you're doing an operation manager, you have to train all of those Santas and elves and all the other people who do the other jobs that you work with um, for whom you're responsible in the operations area of things. And so, you know, what were the group influences when you were growing up that you think affected that? And by groups, I mean any group. So it could be your family group, which is what people often start with, but it can also be the area or the region that you were born into, because like mountainous regions and prairies and ocean and island cultures are all specific. That has an influence on people's cultural understandings of the world. It can be ethnicity, it can be language, it can be religion, it can be rural versus uh, small town versus uh, urban It can be, you know, any sports groups that you belong to or, you know, anything that you were interested in a hobby as you were growing up. Do any of those ring a bell for you? Kind of. Um, So I had a very interesting upbringing. Uh, Like my total school count was eight from kindergarten to grade 12. I attended eight different schools and that didn't have anything to do with me being pulled out of one and put into another because of reasons or whatever. It was just, that's how my family moved. They moved around the city uh, just due to the the people that they met and this, the situations that arose. Uh, we moved to, a, my mom and I moved to a different country. Um, so I experienced a little bit of uh, cultural life in Australia when I was in grade four, when I was uh, nine, nine, 10 years old. Um, and then as far as as far as friendship groups, you know, of course, because of those moves and because of those changes, I was, you know, kind of pulled away from friendship groups and introduced to new ones. And, and I never really formed, you know, super long term friendship bonds until my late my later years. So I guess what that means really is that it kind of comes down to um, variability. That's what I learned. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I think you're looking for the word third culture kids that have traveled a lot and lived in different places adopt a sense that they are more comfortable with people who don't fit into a specific group and they are able to bridge between groups quite easily they don't feel rooted to a particular group or that they belong to a particular group but they they have characteristics from it and they have adopted usually unconsciously characteristics from all the places that they lived in and groups that were there, but not at a really deep level, at a sort of broad level. Does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Just kind of that flexibility of different upbringings kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone who's lived in the same place all their lives develops a depth of understanding. They become better at bonding within that particular group. People who've moved around develop a breadth of understanding. They become better at bridging. Very cool. I think you're probably the bridger type because of all the things you've been able to do and morph into. I can definitely see that, you know, being a part of my success today. Okay, I'm going to stop analyzing you. (laughs) What about groups that you joined? So as you grew up, you must have learned something like you have a diploma in finance and you're a photographer. What about those things? What aspects of the way people think and act and believe and feel in those groups has affected you? Well, that's the thing where um, I took finance at Nate, but that was a bit of a scapegoat for me. I was working in banking, you know, starting at a young age, right out of high school. That was cool and all, but it's totally not my thing. There's a ton of policies, procedures, rules, regulations, and all that ingrained into the banking world. And it was very convenient that that was delivered to me at such a young age. And it gave me a lot of uh, professionalism in my background there. But it didn't speak to me. It wasn't what I was into. So I I would say I was very distant from it, especially like, you know, going into school for it. It just didn't fly with me. So the one thing that really did fly with me is, is, you know, I discovered B&I around the same time and their core values and their philosophies are very much what I have internalized, you know, uh, giver's gain, lifelong learning, adaptation, and... Yeah, the two, giver's gain and lifelong learning, 
oh, integrity of business and is another one. But yes, those are things that can definitely influence the way that you think and act and belong. I mean, if you belong to a I group, you're meeting them every week, you're networking um, through the people that you know, but you also connect to an international community fairly easily between regions, um, between countries fairly uh, quickly. So that, again, fits into that idea of belonging to a group that is good with breadth, but can also connect people in the moment. Yeah. So just a question about your name, because Riel sounds like it could be a French name, could also be a Métis name. Do, do any of those have anything to do with you, or is that just something that happened by accident? Well, I'm sure you know of Louis Riel. Yes. Uh, he's my great, great, great uncle. Wow. Yeah. So it's a direct lineage. His kids didn't survive, but his brother's kids did. And his brother's kids are my great, great, great grandparents. Oh, that's too cool. Does that have an influence on who you are and how you act and live? I wouldn't say directly, but if we're talking on more of a spiritual and genealogical level, potentially, you know, I'm not culturally tied to, you know, the Métis community or anything like that. My dad is a very distant person from that. He found his own way and my mom, she was not a real, so she had her own thing. So I just never really fell into that. Mm -hmm. Well, the history of the Métis is that they were bridgers, the same thing. I keep falling into this thing about bridging between cultures and being adaptable because they had to. They were the translators. They knew all the languages. They were the, the first voyagers. They led all the expeditions. Yeah, so some of that somehow through your ancestry has been passed on to you. I think too, and I think that's so cool. What about your mom? Did she identify with any kind of ethnicity or cultural background? Not really, but she's a Powell, and the Powell lineage, they're very interesting too. I don't know any specifics, but I know it goes back, I think, maybe in the Cub Scouts or something like that. I think there's yeah. Powells, so it's just super, super Canadian. No kidding, yeah, like this, the, that whole the Cub Scouts thing, the Métis thing, it's like it's all part of this being there in groups of people and taking part of things and events and uh, bridging across differences, so it's great. How would you say your temperament and personality affect the way you see the world? Temperament's what you're born with. You know, like they say, oh, this kid's very reflective, or this kid's always really scared of things, or this kid's very gregarious. And then your personality is how you adapted to everything that came up as you were growing up. So temperament, personality, how do you think that affects the way you see the world? I guess in three words, I would say rose-colored glasses. Ah, explain um, that one. <laughs> I've always been a very uppity, very happy child, um, always been a bit of an attention seeker and sort of class clown sort of person. But my dad had this thing my whole life. He's written books on it and he's been very passionate about it and it's called Send Love. Mm -hmm. And that sums up my core, my being is just send love, you know, just kind of ignore the negative BS out there. Go with what kind of path of most positivity sort of, sort of thing. Yeah, I can definitely see that because even just looking at your picture and the first time I met Devin at, at a conference where he was the conference photographer and he would just looked so relaxed. I thought now most conference photographers would look either bored or they would look like really stressed, but he didn't look like either of those. He looked so relaxed and he was interacting with everybody. And that's why I asked him how he got started in his business. Nice smile and, you know, open face that makes people want to talk to you for sure sounds so much like that would have been a quality that you were born with and that you just carried through with your life. Yeah. I feel I exist uh, in this world to not make people smile, but if I can let someone smile in a day, then I've done my part. So that's why the role I've kind of found is so fitting because it, it allows me to bring joy to people. No kidding. Even if Lots of even smiles if just... in Santa situations and, oh, yeah. and photography too. Mm-hmm. And so what about your personality? What would you say you've had to grow into yourself? I guess tempering that hyperactivity, that super energy that I've always had, um, that's something I've really had to just over time, just kind of temper down and make sure it's not just overbearing, even though sometimes I let it be overbearing because, you know, I, I don't want to just be stuck down there. So, but just making sure it doesn't get out of hand has kind of been one thing that always comes back to me. You know, ever since I was growing up, my dad would say, you know, just 30 K just pump it down. And I noticed, you know, whatever, whenever I got kind of too excited in social situations, that he'd say, just like, bring it down. This is all good. This is such a conservative culture here in Alberta. People are enthusiastic and everyone looks at them like there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad you still retain some of your enthusiasm. Uh, can you think of a time when you became aware that what you, how you understood the world was in fact specific to you and your cultural understanding and not just normal for everybody? I definitely can't think of a time, uh, like a specific realization, but I kind of always know when I was not normal. There was never a time where I'm just like, oh, I'm not normal. It's just been that way. That seems like it's the norm and I'm not there. Whenever I'd look out at, you know, people doing their thing and it's just hasn't jived with me at any time that I can recall. Well, you were going from one place to another and didn't know whatever those rules were of belonging and you'd have to negotiate it. The normal for you was just having to negotiate the new situation. Is that what you mean? Uh, sort of. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of it comes down to a bit of uh, parental brainwashing on my dad's side because he didn't want me to be normal to you what does that mean be normal to me it's hard to say well how do normal people act what do they do Uh, normal people usually watch the news normal people tend to try to fit into a certain category so they feel like you know they need to find a, a relationship you know a romantic partner they think it's a requirement obligations, I guess, is what it comes down to. I find that people tend to think they have to be something. To conform to social expectations. That's exactly what I mean to say. I find that people really let their life be driven by that. Or what they imagine the social expectations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what they've been told, you know, what they've been told the societal norms are and the cultural norms are, it's something that's always on their mind. It's always playing on them. Mm-hmm. And I just feel slightly immune to that. Mm-hmm. So other people you're saying are who you would consider to be sort of people falling into the expectations of societal norms. They would be driven by the idea of wanting to find a life partner, to have a secure job, to have financial stability and those kinds of things. Or perhaps they'd be driven to do something where they get a chance to travel. You know, like, is there something that drives what you're doing? I'm just a little stumped there. Technology. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely drives me, for sure. Improving efficiencies wherever possible. That tickles me, for sure. That's a good driver. So we're just about at the end of the interview here. I'm wondering if someone were to hire you for something. I mean, you're working as an employee, as a manager in Avonlea Group of Companies. But uh, if someone were to hire you and you were good to give them some tips on how to work best with you, what, what, what might you say to them? I like direction. I don't necessarily like you know, intense micromanagement, but direction and follow-up is definitely uh, something key for me. Um, Even though, you know, one of my biggest flaws, admittedly, as a professional is lack of follow-up. You know, it's something that I'm, you know, ever working on improving. But of course, follow-up with me and I'll be there, you know, just as if I were to follow up with someone else, I would expect them to be there. So analysis and follow-up, Right. So giving you a framework to work in that makes sense. So you know where your parameters are. Yeah. And then from there, some feedback and follow up to make sure that you're not just left on your own either. Right. You know, don't micromanage me, but don't just ignore me. Like some kind of a happy medium. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's totally key. And, you know, be open minded unless something's a fact. It shouldn't be stated as a fact. Uh, I guess I am a bit scientific in that sense. Uh, so, you know, if an argument were to arise or, you know, someone feels differently about something, just to keep the emotions and vocabulary on a f- feeling basis rather than a factual basis, it's, I guess, my biggest pet peeve when uh, someone believes a certain thing, yet they deliver it as fact and they get super worked up in their belief. You know, I super appreciate passion in people, but when it's not a fact it's not a fact period i don't know how to describe that either but there's a difference between passion and being opinionated i don't think very many people appreciate someone being opinionated you know like throwing out their opinions as if it were fact and not acknowledging the fact that they feel strongly about it and yet somebody who's passionate about something is acknowledging quite clearly that they feel strongly about it and they're not presenting it to you as if it were the gospel truth I'm just trying to figure that out of my own mind. It is irritating when people want to or purposely manipulate something for their advantage and state that it's fact when it isn't fact. Exactly. So is there something that you'd like to say? Something that we haven't covered yet or came up in your mind as I was asking questions? 
nothing specific comes to mind. I'm a very uh, re- reactive conversationalist. <laughs> You are the first person I've ever interviewed who actually didn't say something after that because you know what? Every time people always say, well, no, not really. And then they launch into the most interesting thing they haven't yet said. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So do you have some information you'd like to share with the audience or something you'd like to promote right now? I'm assuming you would like to promote your business, no? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, our company does uh, commercial and corporate photography as well as events. And my favorite thing to do ever is headshots because I love bringing out that pure joy in someone. Not necessarily like overjoyed, usually in a, in a business portrait, you want it to be somewhat, somewhat reserved um, just so it's not just over glaring smile or anything. But definitely today's business world requires a little bit of uh, positive energy and that equals trust. And when you smile, you look trustworthy. And I find that I'm really good at just bringing that perfect level of trust in a smile out of someone. And I just really love doing that. So if you need a headshot or know anyone who needs a headshot in Edmonton or surrounding area, I would absolutely love to work with you and make that happen. That sounds wonderful. Devin, is there a place where people can see some of your work? Absolutely. They can go to our website, uh, www.avonleestudio.com. Perfect. Well, I'll make sure that we put those links into the show notes for everybody. And I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to be on the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Thanks, Marie. Have a wonderful day. You too. Devin Riel is one of the few people who can say he developed his career in business acumen because of Santa. His first experience as one of Santa's tallest elves showed him that he had great customer service abilities and could organize multiple tasks under pressure. From the influence of a strong mother to the ancestral context of the Métis community, Devin has built a unique and locally dominant photography industry, specializing in events and sports teams, where he can use his skills bridging cultures and keeping multiple stakeholders happy. He uses his photography, project management, and tech savvy to efficiently run both events and a large workforce while continuing to perfect his photography skills. Thank you for listening. And may culture and leadership connections continue to guide and inspire your world. Oh, a quick question. Would you be willing to provide an audio testimonial about a culture and leadership connections podcast you found particularly good? I would love to hear it. You can send me a voice message on Skype. My Skype name is A-M-G-E-D-U-C. That is A-M-G-E-D-U-C. Type it in and leave me a message about what you loved so that we can help feature you. Newsflash, have you downloaded our Future of Work set of three articles? Reading them provides you with the cutting edge insights you need to develop a new career, transition into a different industry, position yourself for a new job, or start a business in ways that are aligned with the trends and disruptions of work in the world today. Make sure you are positioned to both survive and thrive. Download our Future of Work white paper article set here. It is shiftworkplace.co slash future of work white paper. That is shiftworkplace.co slash future of work white paper. And get started on the news you need today to stay current.